The Neighborhood Watch Earth's vast oceans heave and roll as briny reflections of our galaxy. Nothing could better illustrate that striking resemblance than life. While there may be living things in the extreme regions of both, biologists suspect that most organisms bloom in the habitable zones, and the more habitable the zones, the more cunning the organism's minds are. Just look at the creatures of our own planet's watery sections and you'll see the cleverness that swims within the epipelagic region. This is the place where mental cognition floats above instincts. All living things have some measure of understanding, including two worms. But if any species craves more than bacteria dinners, then nurturing physical environments are requisite. In other words, the lowest, most hostile domains of the ocean's depths and the gamma-ray saturated inner galaxy tend to keep bodies tough and brains simple, at least where reasoning means anything. Whether fortuitous or planned, circumstances are pivotal, and if wine fermentation takes time in the right conditions, then the same applies to evolution. Even now, a vintage of enlightened minds only drips and trickles from the Milky Way's casks. According to astrobiologists, planets that lack the heavy metals to shield budding sentience from the sterilizing effects of solar radiation orbit first-generation stars. Planets of second-generation stars might develop organisms, but it's rare, and evolution crawls along slower than a snail's genetic pace. Researchers theorize that the planets of the third generation stars have the best chances of reaping the rewards of wisdom, and only those in the nurturing habitable zones. Planets should avoid temperature extremes and not press their equators against any roasting stars. Lull in the balmy breezes and let the eons do the rest. Considering that the number of worlds in our galaxy abounds in the trillions, it sounds like an understatement to say that complex human equivalent smarts are uncommon. Damn near non-existent is a better description. Just a peek at the electron configurations of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and even a failing chemistry student would see why galactic life forms use amino acids as their foundations. These four building block elements interlock like jigsaw pieces, creating perfect molecular fits. The entire cosmos readily buys into the simple, efficient designs. Intense radioactive environments may favor tripled or quadrupled chains instead of the double helix found on Earth. Chains could link tightly together or otherwise, depending on a planet's location in the Milky Way. And another causatum follows after nature dumps the ingredients into the mixture. Earth-like planets not devastated by asteroid strikes, and orbiting sunlight stars will eventually grow organisms identical to our own terrestrial varieties, right up to their most intelligent species. The claim to the title of vanguard culture hinges on which started first and what the participating stars originally offered. Six races from six different star systems developed exceptional technologies before proto-humans climbed down from the fruit trees. They use faster than light space travel and have been in contact with each other for millennia. More than perfunctory communication binds them, and feelings of companionship and belonging pervade the heavens. What ties them together is not their machinery, but their morals, an identical code of conscience deeply rooted in each of the six cultures. But why shouldn't their ethics be the same? Their physical environments mirror each other's. A textbook example of the rule of convergent evolution, which also explains why we look so similar. Maybe not exactly, but passable in a dimly lit room. Upheavals hammered out the histories of these extraterrestrial civilizations. The brightest always begin as savage, territorial carnivores that eventually either find coexistence or find extinction. No child escapes growing pains. As time unfolded, these worlds, which shine like novae in the darkness of space, found each other. Through advancement and determination, the hexad of planets finally assembled. 
Then they turned their attentions toward old soul and watched earth ever since humans first transitioned into Homo sapiens. These observers would have seemed like gods to the earthlings of thousands of years ago. Yet these spacefarers knew that someday humankind would join the Alliance. Once united, Terra's new partners would thrust humanity to such elevated levels of technology and evolution that even when compared to our present selves, the futuristic, star-hustling humans would seem like gods. But first we needed the principles and restraints to gain permission to take that enormous leap. Left alone, we may never join those who are waiting. With the help and guidance of several advanced societies, though, it could be done. If not, our disappointed mentors could redline Earth from the astral neighborhood. Pleistocene winds and frosts blasted roaming mammoths, transforming their woolly hides into granite-hard coats. The ethically unenlightened Cro-Magnons who followed the herds wandered along trails littered with elephant dung. Want and famine inspired treachery, craftiness, and murder. These ploys served as survival strategies, not yet banished to the realm of evil. A bearable day for these upper Paleolithics meant catching the needed prey and scavenging enough wild grains from ice-bound ranges to feed their malnourished clans. They did not invite interlopers from any planet. It was too early in human social development for our celestial friends to interfere. Sumerians made the first noticeable strides toward philosophical reflection. Unquenchable intellectual thirst spurred other cultures to grow into civilizations. The patient neighborhood watch of extraterrestrials saw Earthlings clearly finding their way. Hellenic scholars followed by laying the groundwork for ethics, politics, mathematics, and metaphysics. The neighborhood watch knew the moment to get involved drew closer, but the Greek kindling only smoldered. It would be the next generation of civilization after the ideas caught fire. The Romans did not know the honor granted to them. The low craggy hills of the Carmel Range broke through the grassy lands like armored plates. Hard and coarse, the color of straw, with countless caves that punctured these barren rocks like spear wounds. On either side of the long-worn sill lay the best pasture land that Israel could offer. The shadows of summer grew long, and the suffocating dry air waited for the cool rainy season. Flocks of sheep rested in the shade of the leeward brae. The thieves and cutthroats who used the tunnels for refuge also slept. In one of those hillside chambers, far off any path and hidden away, dwelled the cult of the Essenes. Generations before, God picked this small band of devotees to someday bear the Messiah. Their ragged clothing and undisguised poverty made that difficult to believe, except for the steadfast. The Essenes took great care when the faithful crossed the threshold into marriage, and Yahweh always had the final word. The Almighty's light shone too brightly for human eyes to behold, but still, he spoke unequivocally. Our Lord ascended those newly betrothed and altered their souls. Often, the change proved unbeneficial. God repeatedly rejected the pledged, usually bringing death before consummation. The Holy Father worked in mysterious ways. Emerentia believed in the Lord's wisdom and did not doubt his reasoning when her first husband died on their wedding night. At last, Stolanus, her chosen husband, who stayed with him the longest, proved worthy of having a child with such a pure woman. Some said that God instilled Stolanus with unearthly properties and facilities that allowed him to survive and propagate the extraordinary child they named Anne. The Essenes knew Anne descended as a gift from heaven's womb. There seemed to be no crisis her mind could not solve and no disguise she could not see through. Anne chose monastic life and considered contemplation and virginity to be the highest virtues. She served this purpose faithfully until her middle age years. Then the Lord's messenger addressed the congregation in a shared dream. This vision of Gabriel announced that Anne's family line would usher in the Messiah and Anne would bear the next link in a chain. These guiding words told Anne that she would give birth to Mary, the mother of the Redeemer. 
God chose Joachim as Anne's husband. Joachim had spent a year in the Lord's private care and returned as a different man than the one shaped from earth's clay. Joachim assumed his place as Anne's spiritual equal. And so Mary came into the world, and it was time to leave the Essenes and enter the bustling metropolis of Nazareth. Mary needed acclamation to city life, and the future Messiah needed an audience ready for vocal swaying. Soon after Joachim's descent to earth, followed by Mary's birth, Yahweh gradually revealed himself to the small family. The Divine Father became less intangibly impressive and more comprehensible, although never mundane. Anne and Joachim at last admitted to each other that they had more in common with the arcane creator than in their grounded, doubting acquaintances. The preternatural child Mary became the connection connecting the flesh and dirt world to the glorious realm. Mary seemed on a benign footing with the Lord and enjoyed occasional visits from his mysterious messenger angels. Anne and Joachim took to calling the benevolent visitors messengers. Mary still needed to assimilate to her mortal community and its indigenous culture. The family of Joachim settled at Nazareth. Mary learned her domestic role from her mother and the ancient Hebrew rites from the local temple school. Within a decade of their relocation, Joachim died and Anne remarried, leaving the young daughter in the care of the temple Essenes. Mary lived in a tabernacle, serving the women of the synagogue, offering Hebrew services, and committing to a celibate life. Though her life improved and she rose above her former poverty, Mary remained as humble as the dust that covered her feet. The future mother of God knew through her audiences with the angels that fate had embraced her. She would give birth to the Messiah. The Blessed Virgin achieved divinity, and the rabbis and temple workers understood as they remained inconspicuously informed. The clerics wisely kept humankind's hope cloistered rather than prematurely arousing the suspicions and ire of Herod. When Mary reached her teen years, the Messiah's impending coming illuminated the darkness like a lighthouse beacon. Messengers had informed the chosen confidence of the temple that Mary would conceive mystically without the need for a man. In reality, the extraterrestrial eugenics project had reached its climax. Still, an expectant wife needed the decorum of a supportive husband. Community rejection of Mary and the coming deliverer would end alien aspirations. Angels decreed that Joseph, and a scene many years older than Mary and privy to the plan, would stand as the unearthly woman's husband and everything would play out quietly and without controversy. Then, in all reverence, on a clear, crisp, starlit night, Jesus was born and gently placed in a straw-lined animal manger in the Bethlehem temple. Jesus' intellect matured at an astounding rate. In that respect, he followed in the footsteps of his mother and grandmother. He grew beyond the child's precociousness and by his late teens drew larger and larger crowds to each of his affecting sermons. Jesus spoke in parables and anecdotes and always saw the need to justify the words with heuristic applications. He practiced what he preached and encouraged his followers to do the same. The main point of his homilies, no matter how esoteric or abstract, was repentance, sincere regret for wanton offenses and taking steps to correct the sins. The Son of God found translating this message challenging. After half a generation of itinerant preaching, Jesus and his disciples had wandered through the parched lands from Nazareth to Bishira and Masada and beyond. His message of repentance held as a central theme, but over time Jesus also saw the need to motivate people to forgive those who morally sinned or violated the local statutes. It then happened just outside Jerusalem when a test challenged the two ideas. The temple Pharisees brought forth an adulterer for Jesus to judge. Passion drove the outrage mob and they wanted to stone the woman to death. Jesus stood his ground and said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. 
A volley of words further erupted, but eventually Jesus prevailed. Afterwards, when the crowd dispersed, Jesus said to the forgiven woman, Neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Christ saw hopeful signs that his two messages, repentance and forgiveness, generated the heat to melt some of the icy hearts, and he rejoiced. Judas, however, didn't share in the delight. Judas, the burly red-haired newcomer, joined the band of disciples willingly, but soon earned the group's mistrust as the eternal outsider. But none of the disciples of Jesus fit into the common societal expectations either. Though dressed in drab, tattered tunics and robes, they each held the talents to lead their own flocks and their own kingdoms. After Jesus left the village, two or three disciples, or apostles, stayed behind for several months to establish schools in Jesus' theology. These crusading tutors then handpicked and groomed local oratories to operate the new parishes. The mentors would later rejoin their brothers. Still, Judas stood out. Judas never left his master. They had remained inseparable since the day the brawny man joined the kindred circle. The secular perspectives of Judas carried disquieting weight with the Good Shepherd. The Lord frowned when Judas suggested that the Almighty Father may not be omnipotent. Jesus found reasons to keep Judas close rather than leave such a convincing doubter alone. Who would the fledgling ministry serve if the contentious apostle had his way? Months passed together, and then one evening in Jericho, Judas approached Jesus and abruptly the roles of teacher and follower reversed. We must travel to Perea. Your mission depends on a meeting, Judas unexpectedly asserted in measured and adamant words. The firm tone annoyed Jesus. My mission is to spread the ideas of repentance and forgiveness, Jesus grumbled. A difficult undertaking for sure, but I do the job adequately. What is in Perea? You need to meet someone. Your mission is going astray, and this person will help you find the right path, Judas forthrightly replied. Anger flared from the Lord of Lords. What do you know of my mission? What does somebody from Perea know about my mission? You are talking to God. You have the audacity to tell God that he is wrong about the truth? What mortal being can provide knowledge to God? Fury replaced anger. Judah stayed calm, as if he expected this reaction. I know who you are, son of Mary, the physically imposing assistant softly replied. You do not recognize me? Has your pride in yourself blinded you? The messianic rabbi glared at the impertinent pupil, but could not remember the brawny man beyond the past year. After a moment, Judas answered his own question. I am a messenger. Jesus stiffened and paled. Who? Who are you? The anointed one stammered. The outspoken disciple ran out of patience. I am the archangel Gabriel, Judas made clear, the messenger who foretold your birth. But to you and for this mission, I am Judas Iscariot. Now pack your supplies. At daybreak, you and I leave for Perea. The other apostles will wait and teach, and we will return to them shortly. The desert air at dawn was damp and clammy. Irritating cold assaulted the skin, as if wearing wet linens on a windy, frigid morning. Goats and sheep cried for food as the two unassuming beings set out and walked the beaten path toward the Jordan River. Even at that hour, criminal eyes watched the pair but instincts of self-preservation kept the bandits at bay. Although alone and weaponless, the supernatural men had nothing to fear from any mortal attacks. By the time the blazing sun had reached its peak, they stood on a dock that rose knee-high above the dry, cracked banks. The grimy ferryman, smelling of sweat and roasted goat, balked at crossing the muddy waters in the baking heat, but Judas paid him enough to make it worthwhile. Then, upon reaching the eastern side, they continued toward their destination. They drank sparingly, but neither food nor water concerned Jesus and Judas, nor fatigue. 
The Oberon angel claimed origins other than earth, from a place where sustenance came by other means. Jesus rightfully declared human status, but then again he could declare more. By supper they had crossed the low-lying plains of Moab and entered the dusty city of Beth Nimrah. There they ate at a crowded, raucous inn and slept in one of its above-rented rooms. The two travelers awoke before sunrise and headed away from the densely populated, noisy, and chaotic town center. Businesses opened early. Jesus and Judas could hear voices arguing and negotiating over grains, butchered meats, and finely tailored clothing. The pilgrim's direction took them to the outskirts, where the affluent lived in quiet comfort. This suburban neighborhood, however, excluded the homes of herd owners, land barons, and wealthy merchants. This wide swath of flat, arid land belonged to retired military officers who had distinguished themselves during their long careers. As compensation, senators awarded them large tracts and generous pensions. The pair walked upon a tamped-down gravel road leading to the well-earned compounds and observed the planners designed this community in a practical, thought-out formation. Judas smiled at the straight, orderly dwellings that lacked imaginative flair. They suited the rigid tenants. Goats and sheep roamed each enclosed field, and substantial vegetable gardens grew inside cordoned areas of the properties. The animals ate their own food. Every home had a front yard with a flag flying high above the rooftop. The colors of the various banners differed, as each represented an officer's former legion. Judas knew where he was going, and Jesus followed apprehensively. At last, they came to a square, high-walled manor surrounded by a cedar picket fence. The grinning owner stood at the entrance gate, waiting for them. Welcome, travelers, the amiable host greeted. I guess this day was inevitable. Good tidings, Gratus, Judas solemnly replied. I have brought a guest. The Son of God silently studied the middle-aged Nall Gratus. Despite Jesus' pedigree and charisma, he knew he stood in the presence of an extraordinary man. Greetings, younger Simon, Gratus coyly said to Jesus. Do you have any idea who I am? Christ stared at the scarred, pockmarked Gratus. The cavalry veteran tilted slightly, as if arthritic from too many horseback battles. Short and balding, the leathery skinned man looked robustly built. The Lord replied directly, No, sir. However, my name is Jesus. Have we met in the past? Gratis nodded through a preoccupied gaze. Let us talk inside, out of the heat, he said, and the callers followed this enigmatic man into the mud brick residence. The spacious, smartly built house maintained an induction breeze. Skylights covered by stretched animal skins bathed the rooms in a soft golden glow. As Jesus expected, the interior shined like a newly minted aureus coin. Only the three occupied the house. If Gratis had a family, they left for the day. Not one servant attended them. Gratis offered cool wine and mutton while they sat around the olive wood kitchen table. Gratis grew serious. You are Jesus now, but thirty years ago you were Simon the stout man mused. I know who you are, and I know who Gabriel is. He waited for the charismatic rabbi's mind to absorb the statement. Then Gratis continued, We are all made to follow relevant paths. You are the Messiah. Gabriel is the messenger, and I am the assassin. Judas watched Jesus, hoping that their journey didn't end in vain. So, I am doing something wrong. Judas, or should I say Gabriel, tells me, and you are supposed to set me on the truest line, Jesus stated with a tinge of sarcasm. What should I be doing? And who is this Simon you claim I am? Gratis and Gabriel looked at each other anxiously. The former serviceman scratched his chin, then began. Faith tells us that there is a supreme God, but what we discuss here today does not concern the Almighty. We speak of mortal issues, despite how mind-boggling they seem. The time has come for humanity to focus on achieving a necessary goal, 
and only through the pretext of a zealous religious movement may success be possible. The Savior's face became blank and colorless as he listened, as if water now filled his veins. Jesus, you are not God, the old warrior explained. You are half human and half otherworldly. Half of your essence comes from another flickering point in the heavens. Mortal beings from other regions, hidden in the blackness of space, have come to earth to guide us to paradise. You were born of several faraway places, actually, and your endeavor is to begin remolding humanity to think in larger ethical ways. Something stirred in the Son of Mary, a sudden awareness. Your function, Gratis went on, is to get humans to think like these alien beings so that eventually we can join them and live in peace and prosperity. If not, then we may up wretched, purposeless, and lower than the beasts of burden. Simon of Perea was the tentative Messiah, but he took too many missteps. He became violent and destructive, the exact opposite of our intentions. After he burned down the royal palace of Jericho, Gabriel summoned me to assassinate him. I did that with deepest regret because, although I am just a man, I am one of the inner Essenes. The face of Jesus flushed from the revelation. I am not God. I am not God, he mumbled. How could I have been so arrogant? The Lord did not doubt the explanation. A long pause of silence followed. At last Jesus spoke, but without the air of superiority. What happened after Simon's death? How am I, Simon? We always have backup plans, Gabriel replied, now speaking in the words of the detached bioengineer of his training and not the angel of the Annunciation. We presently conduct this project in multiple locations to account for the unpredictable variables, and each enterprise is at a different stage of development. You are Simon, so to speak, one generation hence. The reason that we made this journey here was to get you away from those awestruck disciples. You could not think rationally around them. Their blind worship of you clouded your judgment. I knew that if anyone could ground you in reason, it would be gratis, so here we are. Jesus nodded in agreement. Good idea. It worked, he willingly admitted. Now you can tell me where I am going wrong and what I should be doing instead. This sudden twist of reality would have strained the sanity of anyone, but our neighboring Stella friends enhanced the brain of this hybrid child to absorb, reason out, and adapt to these mental upheavals. We feared you'd be as incorrigible as Simon, Gabriel reflected, but perhaps that is not so. You seem to be adaptable, the engineer continued. You heard what Grata said about Simon. Simon spun out of control. He took the message and planted inside his brain and adulterated it. We take the blame, really, because inserting aims and motivations into the unborn with the exact intensities needed is not precision mechanics, even for us. Gratis forcefully extracted Simon from society. In your situation, Jesus, you are only preaching a partial message. Confusion seized the Messiah, and his brow furrowed. I am teaching what I know and what I feel is right, he weakly defended. What more can I do? Gabriel remained dispassionate and spoke further while Gratis looked on. You are pleading repentance, which is feeling remorse for injuring a fellow human being. Hopefully, the perpetrator will then take steps to correct the offense. That is an adequate message. Recently, Jesus, you have proclaimed the virtues of forgiveness, forgiving those who have committed anything from slight peccadilloes to gravely affronting the innocent. We imbued this into your mind as well, but it took too long for the idea's retrieval. At the rate your mind is emerging, there might not be enough time in your remaining days on earth. Jesus tensed. Time for what? Time to spread the advanced concept of mercy, Gratis interjected. That is true, Gabriel agreed. Regret is a potent emotion, and forgiveness may be a powerful reaction. 
but they can also be passive feelings and go unnoticed. Mercy, for what it invokes, can change the course of the Nile because mercy is the action of the power wielders. Most see mercy as God's grace, a gift inspiring mutual esteem. That applied compassion can affect the way a society decides its ethical road. A malign king or an injured general, Gabriel elaborated, each can smite their transgressors. Forgiving when you have the might and a justification to avenge is what mercy is about, and that is what you must now preach. Advanced sky civilizations will not bother with earth, much less give humans the medium to destroy if they cannot see beyond their spite. Only through the absolute understanding and application of mercy will earthlings be worthy of extraterrestrial mentoring. And that is my new mission, to preach mercy to the rich and powerful, the Messiah asked. Your mission is to proclaim repentance, forgiveness, and especially mercy to the powerful, the extraterrestrial clarified. The unobtrusive and the docile must see how the strong show mercy because someday those very meek will inherit phenomenal abilities. Jesus, you are the loose stone that causes the rock slide that causes the avalanche. From your message, the complete ethical transformation may take thousands of years, but it must come. The mountain I climbed to reach the souls of humanity just became much steeper, the half-human contemplated aloud, and I know my time on earth grows short. My visions are revealing. Gabriel saddened as he looked at Jesus. Then the alien said, Soon the Roman Empire will collectively wail in repentance for what it will do. Yet from that regret will come the birth of a mercy that will purge the empire and eventually sow the seeds of tolerance and enlightenment across the blessed, fertile earth. You will be at the center, Jesus, and I will be at your side.